Hello, I'm George Smith and this is the first of at least five talks on the history of libertarian ideas. The subsequent talks will each focus on a particular theme in the history of libertarian thought. And by a theme I mean a recurring idea or set of ideas such as freedom of conscience or spontaneous order or the idea of property, etc., etc. And each talk will take one or two of these themes and develop it historically. For this talk, however, I want to give you an overview of five major disciplines that contributed substantially to our appreciation of and understanding of freedom. And those five disciplines were first philosophy, which is pretty obvious, uh, second history, which the contributions of history are somewhat less appreciated than philosophy. Third is economics, again pretty well understood the importance of economics for a theory of a free society. The fourth is sociology, which may seem counterintuitive because when we think of sociologists today, we usually think of uh, kind of comparing society to an organism and uh, people tend, who are sociologists tend not to be libertarians. And fifth, what I call social psychology. Before uh, going through those disciplines very briefly, obviously given time limitations, I want to discuss some preliminaries. Uh, first of all, what do I mean by libertarianism? For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be using the term libertarianism more or less synonymously with what is known as classical liberalism. That is, liberalism as it existed in England and Europe and in the United States prior to the, say, early 20th century. I'm sure many of you know this, I won't go to it, into it here, but the term liberal and liberalism, those terms were more or less co-opted by so-called new liberals, or what we now call welfare state liberals, during the late 19th century. Uh, people that, that we now describe as libertarian before that time would call themselves liberals. Herbert Spencer, for example, referred to himself as a liberal. So I'm, when I talk, say libertarian, I mean roughly the same as classical liberal. A, I think a fair definition of libertarianism would say that libertarians believe that all human association should be voluntary and that the use of coercion, and by coercion I mean physical force or the threat of physical force, the use of coercion should be restricted to self-defense or to retaliatory uses such as if someone's stolen your stuff, getting restitution, that sort of thing. Now, oh and by the way, just for the record, I use the terms as philosophers usually do, I use the terms freedom and liberty synonymously, so I'll sometimes use one word, sometimes use the other, and I mean exactly the same things by them. I would say that a libertarian, there's another way of looking at this, going back to Lord Acton's definition of a classical liberal, Lord Acton being the great late 19th century um, Cambridge historian, famous for his remark that um, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord Acton said that a liberal is a person whose polar star is liberty or freedom. Polar star here indicating the ultimate political value, that guiding star that by which libertarians make policy decisions as to what a government should and shouldn't do. If a policy furthers the cause of liberty, therefore if it restricts or obliterates freedom, then of course they're against it. Now one thing about the libertarian conception of freedom is uh, that it is a basically an invisible element in human relationships. Libertarians tend to define freedom in terms of what philosophers call the negative conception. Negative in the sense that freedom is simply the absence of coercion. Thus, if I leave you alone, or if we deal with one another voluntarily, not using coercion, each of us is said to be free, and that is said to be a free relationship. Now, that, that, this notion of negative freedom means that freedom is sort of a very difficult thing to pin down. Uh, freedom doesn't really cause anything, unlike coercion. For example, if someone points a gun at you and says, turn over your money or I'll shoot you, and you turn over your money, there's a sense in which pointing the gun can be said to be the cause of your turning over the money. Well, I had to or he'd shoot me. But freedom doesn't work in the same way. Freedom is just a general condition. Uh, in very few cases would we say, I did X because I was free to do X. There are other motives involved. And for this and other reasons, it can be very difficult to trace or to track the effects of freedom long-term in a society. For example, what's the long-term effect of freedom 
uh, on virtue. Well, you have people who are more or less virtuous in a free society than in a society that's not free. Or what are the long-term economic consequences of free trade and private property? Are people better off or worse off on the whole uh, under freedom? Uh, there are many questions like this. What's Another one would be, what's the effect of freedom on social order? And here I want to make a very important point, um, which uh, is a bit of digression, but it's an important point. And that is that if you can have a theory of freedom, it sounds great, everyone should be free. A theory of justice that says, you know, you can only deal with people voluntarily, to coerce them is unjust. And people might accept that in the abstract, but if people are convinced that your theory of freedom would lead to social chaos, sort of a Hobbesian war of all against all, then they're not going to accept it. So any satisfactory libertarian theory has to have two components. It has to have, on the one hand, a theory of freedom as defined by the rules of justice. In other words, you're free only so far as you don't commit injustice against others. And on the other hand, it must have a theory to explain why the people acting under this freedom will still maintain a minimum degree of social order. So on the one hand, we have first what philosophers call the normative or moral issue, how free should people be? And secondly, we have what philosophers call the descriptive, or, or um, a positive, that's sometimes called, the descriptive issue of what will happen to society when people observe that great degree of freedom. And this sort of ought part and the is part are brought together with the various disciplines that I mentioned earlier those disciplines being philosophy, history, economics, sociology, and social psychology. It's quite interesting to look at the rise of some of these disciplines in particular, perhaps economics being the most obvious case. And one sees that the early proponents of economics as a science were in many, many cases advocates of free trade. And there was a reason for this. They were objecting to the mercantilist or pro-government regulation policies of monarchs in 17th century uh, Europe and, and uh, elsewhere, and they had to have a theory to explain why free trade, even though it doesn't seem to have the same short-term effects as a, as a regulation, it seems simple, we'll just pass a regulation, we'll fix it that way. They wanted to explain how the long-term effects of free trade are much better and benefit everyone, not just special interests. Uh, the same is true of all these other disciplines like sociology and so forth. So what we're dealing with here is an attempt by libertarian philosophers and social theorists on the one hand to defend the moral priority of freedom as the highest political value and on the other hand to explain the beneficial effects of freedom. Now, <clears throat> another more or less side note that's very important because sometimes people look at libertarians and they say, well you guys are, are positing a utopian society. You just want this utopia, it's never going to happen, etc., etc." Let me be clear about this. Traditional utopias, and that word means nowhere, uh, Thomas More was the first to use it, I believe, uh, I think he invented the word, uh, utopia means nowhere. And a lot of these classical utopias that you look at uh, required a change in human nature. Human beings as they were could not bring about this utopia. Human nature itself had to change. And sometimes in Christian theology there had to be a redemption from original sin. Original sin made it impossible for people to live in an ideal world. But if you were saved, especially in these radical Protestant groups in the uh, 17th century, uh, if you were, uh, if, according to some theories, if this original sin were taken away, then you didn't even need any human laws because you would naturally be good. Now, the, the libertarian view is not that kind of view. It doesn't posit an ideal, it, pos it doesn't posit a perfect society. It has, of course, its own conception of an ideal society. It had, I think most people do, the, the kind of society that we'd like to see. But that kind of society does not require a, a change in human nature. It takes human beings as they are and says, given human nature, what's the best kind of society that we could hope to achieve? But here's an important point. A lot of philosophers, especially those in the Aristotelian tradition, will say that the purpose of political philosophy, one of its purposes, is to tell us what a good society would look like. I would maintain, in contrast, that in libertarian theory, all political theory can do is tell us what a just society would look like. And there's an important difference there, as Adam Smith pointed out. Uh, in uh, one of his books in the late 18th century. A just society is one in which everyone's rights are respected. But that type of society isn't necessarily the best possible society, because you could have real jerks 
who don't interfere with one another's lives or leave each other alone, but don't care or aren't feeling um, and that sort of thing. So the point I'm making here is that libertarianism doesn't say we advocate a perfectly good society. They say we're trying to go for a just society. But it recognizes that there are many other virtues like benevolence and goodwill between people. Those virtues are voluntary virtues. And even if you have a just society, you also need these other virtues voluntarily accepted and that become habitual among members of society to make it a truly good society. So I just wanted to clear that up. And I want to quickly run through the five disciplines I mentioned earlier. Obviously a lot of material here. I'll specifically be discussing them as they arose historically in the sense of what they contributed to our understanding of freedom. And uh, as we get into the other uh, subsequent talks, you'll see how these disciplines come in and play more specific roles in developing certain ideas. Here I just want to give a very general idea of what the disciplines are and what they tended to focus on. The first discipline, of course, that I mentioned was philosophy. I've already gone through a number of the things that philosophy is concerned with. Defining what freedom is is, of course, a philosophical issue. Philosophy in general terms, as I see it, deals with uh, fundamental concepts. Uh, the, when you have, if you go through a science, say, and as you get down to what is this and what is that and what is physics, when you ask what is a particular science, in this case I want to say what is a particular discipline, what is sociology, what is economics, I would maintain that the disciplines themselves cannot justify their own existence in the sense of explaining what they are and why they're useful from a knowledge point of view. Philosophy is uh, necessary for that. Uh, specifically, philosophy tends to link together these dis different disciplines through a common conception of methodology. This gets rather technical, I won't go into it here, but so far as we're concerned, philosophy plays a key role in showing us how, for example, economics relates to sociology, or sociology relates to some other discipline, uh, that's, uh, like history, and so forth. Another point I want to make about philosophy concerns a very well-known doctrine, but one that is not uh, widely understood. And this is a doctrine that goes back at least to the ancient Stoics. It's a very old doctrine. This was the idea, and it became a central to libertarian and classical liberal thinkers like John Locke, that is sometimes called the natural equality of humankind. They would say mankind, but I'll be politically correct and say humankind. Um, now, what does this mean? Well, a lot of people might think they, they might interpret equality in the sort of the sense that we all have equal abilities, da da da. No, that's not what it meant at all. What it meant in the classical liberal tradition was simply this, that we're all born morally equal. That is to say, no one is born, no human being is born with innate moral authority over any other human being. There were theories historically that sought to refute this notion, one of the best known being the divine right of kings. If we ask, why did certain kings get the right, where did they get the right to demand obedience? You know, what gave them that kind of authority? The argument was basically that God specifically pinpointed them as having moral authority over their subjects and that subjects were obligated to obey. Now this is a very important point that I'll be explaining in much more detail when I discuss, discuss the notion of a, the state in a later talk. This has to do with the origin and justification of political obligation. Why are we supposedly politically obligated, morally obligated, to obey our government or whatever citizen, whatever government you belong to? Um, where does that authority come from? What is its basis? This is something that political philosophy uh, examines and has examined in great detail. The important point here is that it requires justification. In other words, if you don't, if you don't, unless you believe that God has specifically appointed his divine uh, delegates on earth and it says you, know, you over there and you over there you have authority granted by me to tell other people how to live their lives and they're obligated to obey because there's basically if you force people if, if like a government does that's what government is is institutionalized force if you force someone if you say look I demand that you do X I command you or you will suffer the consequences well there's two basic ways to look at that one is that person has a moral right to issue that command and that you ought to obey it, not just that you will because you're threatened, but it, you ought to, you have that obligation. And of course the second is, you obey it if you do because you don't, of the practical consequences. This guy may be a thief, 
It may be a bum, he may be a murderer, and if you go along, it's not because you respect him, it's not because you think he has any moral authority, it's simply because he's got the gun. Now, libertarians tend to view government as the latter. They've got the guns, and uh, they, uh, governments uh, should be obeyed to the extent of your own self-interest is involved. But the question here is, do governments have a legitimate moral authority over their subjects? Again, I'll be discussing that. Uh, in more detail in a later talk. I now want to move quickly to history, the discipline of history. It may surprise some people to learn that historically, and I mean by this if we go back say to the 18th century, if we go back to 18th century America and look at uh, people like James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, um, Benjamin Franklin, people like that, Thomas uh, Jefferson perhaps we know is a notable example. These people, which are part, were part of the, what's known as the radical Whig tradition, these people were convinced that the most important discipline for the understanding of freedom was history. They constantly said that, or something similar to that. Uh, the term lamp of experience, history was the lamp of experience. They often quoted, I think it originally came from Lord Bolingbroke, the statement that uh, history is philosophy teaching by examples. Views like this, and again I don't want to make this too historically complicated right now, but it was very common in the 18th century Enlightenment. David Hume, the great Scottish philosopher, once observed that uh, we cannot have experiments in human relationships. With human beings you can't set up controlled experiments, like you might with mice or whatever. Uh, therefore, what empirical data, what experience can you rely upon when you want to draw general conclusions? And he argued that that's history. Uh, history gives us those examples from which we can draw inferences, reasonable inferences. Now, specifically, in fact, Hume at one point said that history reveals to us the springs of human action. It is by observing how rulers behave, for example, that we learn the lust for power, a very common expression in the 18th century. We learn about the lust for power and why rulers cannot be trusted with uh, unrestrained uh, uh, freedom to, to tyrannize over others. Um, one of the favorite philosophers of people like Jefferson was the, uh, the ancient historian Tacitus. Jefferson once called uh, uh, Tacitus the most important of all writers on freedom, or something similar to that, because he thought that Tacitus had shown us the effects of power, the corrupting effects of power on the various Roman empire, uh, emperors. And this was a very major theme in that period. What effect does power have on people? Jefferson once, who was a remarkably honest fellow, said, and of course, in a letter to a friend, and this was before he was, had been president, he said that if you or I ever get into power, we're going to have to be watched as closely as anybody else in power. Unlike modern politicians, they didn't see themselves as, as exceptions to the general rule. Jefferson, like many of his contemporary, divided people into wolves and into sheep. He said when people get into power, they tend to become wolves and they view other people as sheep. And he said he would, which would have to be watched the same way. Hence the idea of eternal vigilance. But the important thing, the information that this sort of, these sort of maxims were based on, uh, was historical information based on what happens when people get power. Another very important theme historically, and this is hard to overestimate or, or overstress the importance of this, was why republics historically that seemed to start out pretty good declined and got corrupted over time and degenerated into tyrannies. There were many historical examples of this in the Italian city-states and some Greek city-states uh, and there was endless discussions in the 17th and 18th centuries about why, what was the cause of this decline. Did republics, which they thought needed to be restricted at that time to a small geographical area, was the decline of republics necessary or could it somehow be avoided? And if it could be avoided, how could it be avoided? We see a, a similar thing in the very title of Edward Gibbon's great book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, there was sort of a at least at times in Rome's history, Rome's history, a republican aspect to it. And, uh, but why that inevitable fall and decline? And a lot of constitutional thought was based on a concern that history showed about what we needed to block the growth of power. And of course constitutions, balance of power, uh, power checking power, that sort of thing, uh, were seen as these institutional barriers to the uh, eventual decline of republics. Um, and to give you one more example of how seriously these people took history, David Hume, I mentioned before, the great uh, 18th century Scottish philosopher, is known to us today as a philosopher, 
but he was perhaps better known in his own day as a historian. He wrote a multi-volume history of England. And he wrote it in the hope that it wouldn't be partisan, because histories of England at that time tended to be viewed as either Whig histories or Tory histories. And the essential period was the period of the English Revolution during the 1640s, culminating in the beheading of Charles I, the execution of Charles I. And Tory histories would be written saying, poor Charles was a good king and you had these fanatical Puritans and da-da-da. Whig histories tended to take the opposite point of view, that, that Charles uh, tried to expand the power of government, he tried to assert his arbitrary rule, he went against the common law of England and the ancient liberties of England and therefore deserved, to get, deserved what he got. Now, Hume tried to write a nonpartisan history, but a lot of people read it as a Tory view. So despite his fairly liberal political leanings, he was widely condemned as a Tory. And Jefferson hated his history so much that he said at one point that Hume had caused more harm among the people of England than all the armies of Napoleon. And uh, it sounds like a bit of an exaggeration, but I, I don't think he meant it as an exaggeration. Uh, Jefferson and his contemporaries considered history so important that he thought that a wrong view of that whole critical period of the 1640s, because he claimed that Hume had misrepresented what had happened, that, uh, and this is a very interesting story, I can't go into it here, but uh, he thought that he had uh, over-romanticized Charles I and not treated the rebels fairly. And so important did he consider that point of view, because he believed that people pick up their political ideas largely from histories, not from philosophy. And there's a certain logic in that. A lot of people read histories and they get, for example, you say French Revolution. What do people think of most mainly? They think of the Reign of Terror, Robespierre, saint Just, and those people. Therefore, when they think of revolution, a certain group of people, they think bad. Or you mention revolution to some Americans, they think of the American Revolution, and they think revolutions may be good. Okay, now, the, the third uh, discipline is economics. I'm really not going to say much about this here. Um, because it's well known the contribution that economics have made. Uh, the, as I think I mentioned before, if you go back historically, the early pioneers of economics, this is especially obvious with people like Adam Smith and going into the 19th century, the so-called classical economists like David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill to a lesser extent, these people were basically free market types. They, they made exceptions, they weren't always consistent. But economics in its early, uh, early era, we might say, was a very pro-free market discipline. And it arose as an attempt to explain the long-range beneficial effects of freedom in various areas. So these economists tended to be opposed uh, uh, to usury laws that you know, set um, maximum rates of interest. Uh, they tended to be opposed to any restrictions on free trade. They tended to be anti-imperialist because they used free market economics to explain how two countries engaged in free trade both benefited. A very important idea and it was well developed especially by Ricardo, a comparative advantage he called it. In other words, without going into details here, free trade is to the benefit of all countries involved in it. Free trade is not a zero-sum game where one country loses only if another country, uh, one country gains only if another country loses. Both countries, or all countries, gain in free trade. And they understood that countries that become mutually dependent on one another for needed goods and services are less likely to go to war because you don't want to cut off those vital supplies. This was in contrast to a, a, a doctrine generally known as mercantilism, also known as economic nationalism, that one country should basically provide all of its own necessities because in case of war, uh, they'll be cut off from, say, military supplies or whatever else they need. That was very much contrary to the classical liberal way of looking at things. They liked countries to be interdependent because it greatly decreased the likelihood that they would go to war and more or less shoot themselves in their own feet, so to speak. Okay, the fourth discipline, uh, again, this is a vast area, but it's sociology. Sociology has a long history. The term itself, sociology, was coined by Auguste Comte, I think in the 1840s. He was anything but a libertarian, and the word got this sort of bad association with being a kind of a, a books on sociology being planner's guide, so to speak, or instruction manual for social planners. Uh, see, if you look here, here's how we can fix this part of society, here's how we can fix that part. But there was a very important wing of sociology exemplified in Herbert Spencer and in his American counterpart, um, uh, 
William Graham Sumner, who was the first professor of sociology at Yale, I think had the first formal chair of sociology in the United States. This was a very pro-freedom, pro-libertarian way of looking at the social world. As for what sociology is, I think in general, in a broad sense, it's fair to define it as a study of social order. And that's obviously a very broad definition. But what sociology enables us to do, in, the, in Herbert Spencer's system, he divided uh, societies into different kinds. One he called a militant, which was basically a hierarchical-based society structured along military lines, command lines going down in hierarchy, and, uh, versus what he called the industrial or free societies, which don't have that kind of structure. Um, a very important theme in Spencer's writing and one I'll develop in a later lecture in more detail as a specific theme. But uh, also, sociology in the area of political sociology is very important for understanding the nature of institutions. When libertarians have traditionally uh, criticized, quote, the state, well, what is the state? It's more than just an association of people, it's an institution. And what are its institutional features, and what do we mean when we say the state is inherently aggressive or exploitative? Uh, to, to understand these sorts of statements that libertarians make all the time, we have to understand the nature of an institution as opposed to the nature of just a bunch of people who gather together for a temporary purpose. And that, in my discussion of the state at a later lecture, is something I'll be dealing with. Finally, the last uh, discipline, which is a bit artificial in that a lot of people consider social psychology to be kind of a branch of sociology. And I should mention, if it's not obvious already, that these disciplines overlap a great deal. It's not as if somebody sat down at a given point in time and say, hey, let's divide up the human sciences, as they're called. Uh, let's, have, let's invent economics and then we'll invent sociology. That's not how it happened. These disciplines arose in different currents of thought for different reasons, and nobody sat down and tried to coordinate them. So, for example, a lot of proponents of sociology, especially what I'd call the pro-interventionist or status proponents, thought that sociology absorbed economics. And you didn't even really need economics if you had sociology. Sociology, for them, was the master social science. And what was called, and some of this was a reaction against the free market policies of classical economics. They said, no, 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 we know better now. We've got sociology. These, these bourgeois economists tell us such and such. Yes, but we now have sociology, and that enables us to explore the broader implications of the free market. We see that it, it, in the Marxist terms, it creates alienation. It does this, it does that. And this spills over also into social psychology. But among the classical liberals, there are a number of fascinating themes that were pursued by them uh, in social psychology. One of the most fascinating for me is the nature of human motivation, the great debate over what is known as psychological egoism. That is to say, are all motives necessarily self-interested? This has been fastened on, this charge has been fastened this view of this view has been fastened on a lot of free market economists. All you people just believe that all actions are self-interested. That, in fact, has not been the case. On the whole, now there's some uh, the the kind of the big figures here in terms of the psychological defenders of psychological egoism, as we'll see at a later time, were Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century and a guy named Bernard Bernard Mandeville in the Fable of the Bees in the 18th century. Uh, Hobbes was anything but a classical liberal, and Mandeville, well, he's sort of an interesting guy to try to figure out. But most of the liberal, the classical liberal types, argued that there are many motives other than self-interest. And although economics may deal only with self-interested actions in the area of wealth, it doesn't mean that's all there is to human beings. And even today I hear these absurd charges, which John Stuart Mill wrote an entire essay refuting in the 1840s, the charge that libertarians just believe in economic man, that is, they think human beings are only motivated by desire for gain, for material gain. And as Mill explains quite thoroughly, this is not the case. All that economics involves, in his view, was abstracting certain features of human beings. In this case, the desire for economic advantage or gain. And it considers those in isolation from other features. But it doesn't mean that there are not other types of motivations. It doesn't mean that the desire for money or wealth is all there is. Mill pointed out, as many uh, economists and social scientists have, that there, each intellectual discipline does exactly that. It abstracts certain features of human beings, motives and so forth, and considers those in isolation, and only that part of human nature. But it doesn't suggest that that encompasses all of human nature. And I've grown so sick of hearing this idea that all oh, you libertarians, you believe in free markets, you're only concerned about the 
economic side of human beings is just utter balderdash. And that's one value of, by the way, one important value of understanding the history of libertarian ideas. Because as I once, as I said, in fact, in my last book, I was going to plug this anyway, the system of liberty themes in the history of classical liberalism. These charges like social atomism and uh, psychological egoism, these are vi villainies without a villain. Because if you go back historically, you might find a few exceptions, but you find almost no proponent of classical liberal or libertarian proponents of free markets arguing in this way. In fact, you find just the opposite. You find everyone from Adam Smith to Herbert Spencer saying, expressing how important the virtues of benevolence, or Spencer defended what he called altruism, using another word coined by Auguste Comte. He thought that perfectly evolved society would be, a per would be a balance of egoistic and altruistic motives. Now, the correctness of that view is irrelevant here. I'm simply pointing out that when you actually go back and read what these people said, it bear often bears little resemblance to what you might have picked up in your college textbooks or what some lefty college professor tells you. So just don't take these things secondhand. Don't even take my word for it. Try to look at the original sources whenever you can. In fact, if I'm looking at a book of the history of 19th century thought, typically what I'll do is I'll look at Spencer, Herbert. If they have something on Herbert Spencer, it's almost certain to equate him with social Darwinism, which is an absolute lie. I've written a lot refuting that. Uh, a, philosopher, a libertarian philosopher named Roderick Long has written a lot refuting that. And few, fewer and fewer Spencer scholars now accept that myth. But if I look at that book and it said uh, Spencer was a social Darwinist, I figure I, don't, I can't trust that author. That author has not done his or her homework and I wouldn't trust uh, that author in other fields. Uh, lastly, on the uh, social psychology side, we find very interesting analyses of the role that self-interest plays, how people acting purely from self-interested motivations can in fact uh, bring about unintended consequences. This of course is sometimes referred to as the invisible hand. That's Adam Smith's invisible hand. That self-interested actions can result in beneficial outcomes that were not intended by the original actor. I want to close though with uh, another way that self-interest was uh, argued. Uh, in other words, self-interest uh, in the coming out of the medieval period, self-interest was often condemned as, as a sort of a vicious sort of disposition, uh, something bad, something to be overcome. As you get through the Enlightenment, self-interest becomes self-love. And again and again, we, philosophers talk, uh, we find philosophers, economists, social theorists talking about the beneficial effects of the pursuit of self-interest. Here's a, a quite a famous passage and one of my favorites. Uh, this is from uh, Voltaire, the famous French uh, philosopher who was a classical liberal. And here he's talking about the problem of religious prejudice. And his point, which is very nicely put, is that if you have, if people trade with one another, things like religious prejudice become secondary. Because if you can make a profit from somebody, you don't care what that person's religion is. And here's how he put it in his famous comment, Voltaire did, in his comment about the London Stock Exchange. Go into the London Stock Exchange, a place more respectable than many a court, and you will see representatives from all nations gathered together for the utility of men. Here Jew, Mohammedan, and Christian deal with each other as though they were all of the same faith and only apply the word infidel to people who go bankrupt. Here the Presbyterian trusts the Anabaptist and the Anglican accepts a promise from the Quaker. On leaving these peaceful and free assemblies, some go to the synagogue and others for a drink. This one goes to be baptized in the great bath in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That one has his son's foreskin cut and has some Hebrew words he doesn't understand mumbled over the child. Others go to their church and await the inspiration of God with their hats on, and everybody is happy. And I don't know how more nicely that could be put. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop here, and we'll pick up uh, with the next lecture on a particular theme. Uh, thank you for listening.